Okay, let's let's dive through it fuck now. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, so everyone can kindly just turn the mics off. Uh, um, we'll go over the house roll, rules in a moment. But yeah, thank you everyone for joining. Um, it's really great to see that even a year after uh, yeah, a year after lockdown, people still have an appetite for this kind of web-based event, um, especially on such a nice day. So thank you so much. Um, my name is Nabila Ahmed. Um, I'm a postdoc at the Sheffield Institute of International Development. And I just wanted to flag that today's event is being recorded. Um, it's the second, this is the second in a series of events uh, designed to create a space for continuing long-standing conversations um, about whether or not we can engage in and how uh, we can engage in um, decolonization in and through the university. This time I'm really excited to be collaborating with like-minded colleagues at Arts and Humanities at the University of Sheffield and also with colleagues at the Department of Geography, uh, namely Ankit Kumar, who sadly couldn't be here today due to teaching clashes but was very much part of the thinking and the organisation behind this event. Um, so as we noted in our event description, we've seen um, in the last few years a series of introspective projects taking place at mostly elite universities across the UK, looking at uh, their complicity in slavery and colonial histories organised by um, across the UK. But when it comes to Sheffield, the conversation appears to have been a little bit slower in momentum. And so we thought we would invite this fantastic lineup of speakers here today to kind of ask some of these questions and think about these um, this kind of introspection. So we have um, uh, a great line of, of speakers, as I've said, we've got Professor Vanessa Tolman from the University of Sheffield itself. We've got Ella Barrett, who's a graduate student from the University of Sheffield and a local to the, to the city as well. We have Pete Evans, who's kindly joining us from the um, Sheffield Council. And we also have the um, wonderful Desiree Reynolds, who's the local activist and scholar, um, sorry, not scholar, writer and poet. Um, and sadly, I have, uh, we regret to say that Radha Kapuri won't be able to join us today because she's currently on medical leave. Um, but yeah, so uh, look forward to hearing what they have to say. For now, I'm going to hand over to my colleague um, Alex Mason to talk a little bit more about decolonization at Sheffield. Uh, but before that, I wanted to um, kind of share this quote from the great Stuart Hall, just to remind us amid this whole kind of din of buzzwords and culture wars discourse, why we're here and why, why we want to do this. So as Hall said, the historical facts of colonialism and slavery come to be dominating recurring issues, not simply as events which occurred in the distant past, but as histories which eat into the present and whose afterlives still organize our contemporary post-colonial world. And that's from Familiar Stranger. Thanks. Okay, so I'll pass on to Alex now. Great, thank you, Nabila. Um, sorry I can't join you through my camera. Um, it's not working, but um, it's, I'm happy to see so many people here. Um, and thank you, Nabila, for uh, leading this um, project and this event. Um, so I'm Alex. I'm currently a uh, project manager in the Arts and Humanities Knowledge Exchange. Um, and in my department, my focus is addressing racial inequities that often underpin university partnership work with people of colour, um, particularly in local communities. Uh, and beyond that, my research background um, as an academic is in race, higher education and literature, um, with a specific focus on whiteness. Um, so I'm really excited to be part of this event today. Um, my desire to kind of get involved uh, arose really because of several conversations I've had uh, recently with people committed to anti-racist work um, inside and outside the university um, and especially around the process of decolonization in Sheffield. Um, many of these conversations have revealed the great work that people of colour especially have been doing to challenge dominant, dominant white narratives in the city, um, but also the challenges of doing so when denied access to resources and information. Uh, and this has in turn led to discussions about universities and the role that they should or shouldn't be playing in the decolonial process. It's clear that whilst decolonial work has been going on for a long time in the city, institutions like the university have taken a greater interest in recent years, especially since the intensification of Black Lives Matter protests last summer. Uh, and this does arguably present an opportunity, but also, and perhaps more likely, a danger. 
the people committed to this work almost always express, rightfully in my view, um, a cynicism about the tokenistic manner in which universities and similar institutions have started deploying the word decolonization, uh, which has, as Nabila alluded, come to replace diversity as a buzzword that seems to achieve very little materially other than to obscure the ongoing operation of systems of white dominance in university spaces, but also society generally. Uh, in this event, we use the term deliberately. Uh, to summarize very briefly, decolonization, in the edu educational context at least, is an ongoing process that exposes and challenges white colonial structures and practices that dominate knowledge production and dissemination in educational institutions. The decolonial process is used to dismantle this model of racial domination and materially transform conditions to allow for alternative ways of thinking, being and doing. The four speakers today have all been involved in this work in Sheffield, even if they approach it from different standpoints and professional backgrounds. We bring them together to discuss the findings of their work, the difficulties and challenges of conducting it, and their views on what role the university especially should and shouldn't play in these efforts going forward. Um, so I'm going to pass over to Vanessa in a second, but before I do, I want to go over just some very short house rules um, just to ensure uh, the event runs smoothly and that people speaking are protected as well. So for the duration of the event, it would be really helpful if everyone could keep their mics off. There are a lot of people in the space um, and just for connection, connection issues, that'd be really helpful. Um, there will be an opportunity to ask questions um, when the panelists have all spoken. Uh, and if those could be directed um, to the moderators, um, which there should be a link on, on the chat function uh, to the right hand side of your screen. Um, that would be great because we, we will pose those questions that you sent to us to the panelists. So if you could send it to us, that would be great. Um, and I guess the last thing I'd like to say is that in the um, conception of those questions, it is important to remember our individual positionalities, the systems of power that we operate within um, and the privileges that we bring to the room. Just And just to be mindful of that um, when asking those questions. So. Um, that's it really. Um, Nabila, if I've missed anything out in terms of the house rules, please um, uh, interrupt me now. Uh, and if not, then I'm, I'm very happy to pass over to Vanessa um, to give her talk. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, I'm really going to set the context for a lot of these discussions and kind of hold up my hand and say a lot of the questions that we're going to discuss we don't have the answers to but this is really what the point of sharing this discussion understanding the journey that we need to go on uh, and i'll start with a quote from another historian who says that historians have a tendency to look down the well of history and see their own reflection and i think that's a really good starting point because that is the issue of as a historian that you have to look at a myriad of histories and histories change and i think really what i want to understand is the clarity and accuracy of understanding the history of Sheffield itself, uh, how that history changes, and how definitely in the light of Black Lives Matter, issue of statues and place names, sometimes historical names can be misinterpreted or misunderstood. So I think having clear access to hot knowledge of history, knowledge of the areas of where we get these names from, and I'll, I'll just give an example. I got involved in a Twitter dispute unintentionally when people were, some people were calling for the renaming of Leopold Square in Sheffield because they believed it was named after King Leopold of Belgium, who was his uh, background and history is just horrendous. But he was actually, the square itself was, those of another issue of empire, was named after Prince Leopold, the son of Queen Victoria. And he was, it was named after him because he opened the college, which then became the university. Uh, in Leopold Square. That's the founding of the university is actually in Leopold Square with the first college there. So understanding one's history is incredibly important and understanding that even if you think the history is set in stone 20 years ago, that looking at the context in which we operate now, we always have to look back on our history and understand new important research which can come to light, which challenges the perceptions. Uh, and I think Pete will talk about some of that, but one of the big things I will say is 
the incredible research project done by University College London on the legacies of slavery, on literally how the industrial society in which England and the UK, Great Britain, is born on, a lot of that money comes from the proceeds of slavery, comes from the Reparation Act of 1833 up to 1837, 1838, where over 50,000 people were compensated for being slave owners. So the question I've always wanted to know is how many of those relate to businesses and people in Sheffield? How much of our industrial history as a city could come from those proceeds? We don't know. We don't know those questions, but I think it's important to start with that. I also think in terms of the collective responsibility for what I would see as proceeds of crime, uh, it is a proceeds of crime in a way, but also how that compensation claim mirrors and affects then compensations for people throughout the last 150 years, how life is defined by being based on the life and value of a slave in the 1830s becomes part of the compensation package, possibly even with the Great Sheffield Flood in 1864. So all of those aspects become part of our shared history as a city, which we don't know about. Uh, and I think we need to understand that. And I think also what I find the role of historians is understanding this. And I don't mean institutional historians or academic historians. All of us are historians on our own right. All of us have access or need to have access to the tools of history to understand our collective responsibility in this space. And uh, I'll, I'll post a, a link to the fantastic database which links all of the uh, reports and conversations and letters from the uh, 1833 uh, abolition of slavery and the reparation and the, the fact that people were very largely compensated through that. Uh, one of the most famous being obviously David Cameron's family uh, and the Peel family who got lots of money from it. Um, so does this relate to Sheffield? Well it does, we don't know how many people uh, were affected. We don't know how many people actually then invested in our city. And then there's also aspect the whole history of the slave, uh, of the aspect of the steel industry in that role. Um, I'd also want to understand is Sheffield University is very proud, as the city is, as of its radical past. And I think we always have a tendency to put forward one or two individuals throughout our history to demonstrate we as a city were radical. And the university often says constantly, we are a civic university, we were paid for by the people of Sheffield. Um, but what does that actually mean? Where does that money come from? How was it used? Um, where was it invested from? I think those are all questions now that we ask ourselves in our own investments, and we ask ourselves that 120 years ago as a university. We need to understand those things. And other universities have gone through this path, ones with more obvious connections to the slave trade in particular, like the University of Glasgow has just set up a fund of 20 million pound uh, um, for to look at this. The University uh, Cambridge have done a two year study, haven't published it yet. Glasgow University, Exeter University, there's, there's lots of what Alex called elite universities, but you could argue University of Sheffield as a Russell group is also an elite university. So should we be looking at our history? Should we be looking at the city together and fully understand so that we're not just looking down the well of history and seeing our own reflection? So I, I think those are the questions that we should be asking. Uh, I'm asking those as a historian and I'm asking those as director of city and culture for the university. And I want to understand how we as a university can work to uncovering or bringing to light or having debates in this area. Um, so that's really my provocation. I'm sorry I don't have the answers. I can answer some historical questions in the area that I work in, but I want it to be about a, a discussion and a path and a journey that we're going on. Uh, and I'm really delighted I've got such uh, great colleagues to stand alongside me uh, and, and an audience that will participate and help us shape this narrative. That's it. Um, fabulous. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Vanessa. That was a great, great start to the conversation. Um, so next we have Ella Barrett, who's a graduate student at History uh, Sheffield History. Um, give the floor to Ella now. Hi, thank you. 
Um, first, I'd like to say a big thank you to the team for asking me to speak today and also organising these events. I think it's really important to have these type of conversations with a mixture of people from both inside and outside of the institution. So yeah, I'm Ella Barrett, I'm a global history student here in Sheffield, having also completed my undergrad here too. When Alex first asked me to speak at this event a few months back, I didn't quite know exactly what to say. But once we got talking about my time in Sheffield, both as a student and within the local community, the script was already written. The funny thing about Sheffield is how you can understand the power dynamics between the university and the city through its geography and architecture. Central to this is the Arts Tower. As a university student, it's an important site on campus. While well, varsity scores are taken, a one-time student display of union solidarity took place, and where annual graduation pictures are taken also. I guess it's a lot prettier than other buildings as it's constantly on my Instagram feed as well. But from afar, you see the Arts Tower University is both part of the city. However, this is not always the case. On closer inspection, its visual absence within the skylines of Attercliffe, Page Hall and Spittal Hill become a striking metaphor into the institution's silence within these local areas in the local community. When I first studied at the university, I was really surprised by the lack of representation within the institution. My history course was taught by people who didn't look like me and studied by very few people who did either. And importantly, we specifically learned only Eurocentric narratives for the first year. They were intellectually limited and empowered in narrative and knowledge I felt alienated by. During this time, outside of academia, I started to become strikingly aware into how the university culture was detached from the remainder of the city. Geographically, my peers and other students would rarely breach the walls of Crooks Moor, Kellam Island, Exel Road and the city's train station. Within this narrative, I could see an emergence of two cities. One was predominantly white and middle class, and the other existed away from these identities within the local community. Both detached and exclusionary from one another. One had power, authority and influence, and the other did not. In 2018, the Royal Historical Society published a race report. It detailed the impact of history as academic discipline in contributing to institutionalising racism and oppression. The report additionally published statistics into the large performance gaps between black, African and Asian students compared to their white counterparts. And even lower statistics into the professionalisation of these ethnic groups into roles and teaching roles and module choices. The report cemented my complete disenfranchisement of the academic history discipline. The striking lack of diversity from all angles between publications, library resources to module themes. The construction of these discussions and debate, debate began to alienate me from the subjects I used to love. However, following the creation of the, the History Department's Decolonization Working Party and my subsequent membership towards the end of my second year, I began to understand how these issues have manifested, but importantly, how they are currently being perpetuated within Sheffield's own department. With the decolonization group, together with students and viable staff members, we attempted to challenge this culture and discuss the role of history department within Sheffield's own community and how we can lead on decolonization projects. Holding a tea chat event in November 2019, we specifically discussed new curriculum changes, both in schools and at university level. Prioritising the importance of representation, cultural enriching histories and the need to challenge national narratives of Britishness was central to our discussion. We also spoke about the intersectionality within the local community and that, and that identity and what it means for historical education in the area. The detail additionally platformed the need for anti-racist teaching within the university and given a needed platform to our members to discuss their own research projects away from the narrow recognition and acknowledgement within academia. Within meetings, we often spoke about the institution's rhetoric within their campaigns and their involvement within the community. Comparing the We Are International campaign to the lack of support to Sheffield's international community and the welfare among its minority students was favoured by the All Are Welcome campaign. This was specifically overlooked during lockdown by not providing vacant rooms to vulnerable migrants and asylum seekers, while the university was continually contacted by local organisations, they instead chose to leave the rooms completely vacant due to bureaucratic decisions. While decolonisation is academic, within academia is a really heavy topic, that one that encompasses an unravelling and oppressive structure. But as Gubi Wakatango mentions, decolonisation is an ongoing process rather than a one-time event. Battling with systems of knowledge, pedagogy and power hierarchies 
within the production and reproduction of Western perspectives is needed to see ourselves clearly. The process of decolonization and the institution needs to be more about decolonizing education. While this is ext of extreme importance, and where I personally struggle due to lack of resources when completing my dissertation, focusing additionally on the transfer of knowledge, expertise, perspectives and resources from the institutional towards the local is just as important. At the moment, I'm fortunate enough to be currently working on current projects within the local community in collaboration with the university. It's valued assistance in the creation of a black walking tour and appreciative input in the establishment of a black history archive at Sadaka, both of works within this decolonization process. Connecting a gap that has too often been distanced. University led campaigns such as, the, such as uncovering the links between slavery and Sheffield's past, headed by students within the history department and respected staff members, works again, to, works again within, the, within the agenda to demystify our national past and to decolonize productions of knowledge within the local area too. Although my journey in, in and around Sheffield is still one of navigation between two separate cities and the total feeling of alienation by my discipline has, discipline has not yet left, what is strikingly evident is that there are people committed to establishing real change and to that I'm really hopeful and optimistic. That being said, I'm reluctant to present the university in this light, as we are continually battling with the institution that upholds damaging power structures. More often than not, it's the valuable few rather than the many holding the university accountable. And this definitely needs to change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ella. Um, that was just brilliant. And it's been a real privilege to uh, hear your thoughts over the last year. Um, so thank you so much for speaking. Um, next, we're going to have um, Pete from the um, Sheffield City Council to share uh, some of the work that he and others within the council have been doing um, in relation to the material legacies of the city and colonialism. So Pete, I will hand over to you now. Great, thanks, Alex. I'm just going to start sharing the screen. Hopefully you can now see the front slide. I, I can't see it on mine. Oh, it's, it's coming up now, okay. Pete. Thanks, Alex. Yeah. yeah, my name is Pete Evans and I'm the Archives and Heritage Manager for Sheffield City Council. And we're just going to have a look briefly at three areas, perhaps. The first one is around the evidence for Sheffield's connections with slavery and the slave trade. And then we're going to pose the question about how representative archives are and where do historians draw their information from. And then the third part, We'll be looking at some public art statues and street names where myself and some colleagues in the council, with the help of the university, both universities, have been looking at what they represent about Sheffield's past. So we're going to dive straight into Sheffield's connections with slavery. And I think the city's always had a reputation for being radical and um, opposing power and being involved in the campaigns to abolish slavery and the role of women in particular in that campaign is probably quite well known and I know my own service back in 2007 we produced a guide to the abolition for the bicentenary and we lauded Sheffield's role in the campaigning and we did do a little bit of work on the connections with slavery um, but not to a very large extent and it's been interesting over the last few months by undertaking yet more research more digging looking at different avenues of research finding more information about with slavery as opposed to uh, campaigning against it. So Sheffield would have benefited in a, in a number of ways. Some individuals may well have been involved in trading slaves themselves, or they may have owned slaves or plantations in the Americas and the West Indies. Uh, some of the Sheffield manufacturers would have supplied goods which were used in the triangular trade. And also lots of manufacturers were producing uh, mainly agricultural tools and knives and hoes, etc., which were marketed to the Americas for use on the plantations. So the earliest reference in the city archives we have is this inventory of 1694. This is of Reginald Wilson, who was a naval officer based in Jamaica, though he was from the Wilson family Broomhead Hall, 
and you can see their large property there on the screen as well. Uh, it's not his original inventory, this is a Victorian copy. We haven't yet established where the original document is stored. So I'm not sure how much you can see on the screen, but uh, there is reference here to a number of slaves. Uh, there was a boy named Mungo, a gentleman named Hector, and a woman named Debbie, and there's a few other unnamed slaves as well. And altogether they're valued at over £100. They're approximately £25 odd each. And the purpose of the inventory was to document the value in a person's estate. In this example, they're quite useful because you can see other property owned by Reginald. So there was a pewter plate worth just a shilling each. So from that, you can work out that slaves were a valuable commodity. There's quite a large Wilson family archive at, in Sheffield. Um, but it mainly relates to their holdings in the city. But I don't think anybody's really researched it afresh to see if there are many connections to their activities in Jamaica. And there are papers in the University of the West Indies specifically about the Wilson plantations. Many of you might have heard of Staniforth Road, which runs right through the middle of Darnall. And it was named after the Staniforth family, uh, particularly um, Thomas Staniforth, who was a businessman and politician. He was originally from Darnall, but he was attracted to the bright lights of Liverpool. He was apprenticed to a merchant over there and went on to become very wealthy. He was heavily involved in trading in slaves. He became involved in politics. He was mayor of Liverpool in the 1790s. This portrait, you can see, it was painted by Joseph Wright of Derby. And at the time, um, Staniforth was described as a member of Liverpool's wealthy and prosperous commercial society. But his wealth was acquired through his extensive slave trading. Again, in the city archives, there's a little bit of information about him. But it's mainly around his Darnall interests. The Liverpool City Archives has his diaries and letter books, which will contain references, I'm sure, to his business dealings as well as his politics. This next image is of uh, William Bragg and his wife, Martha, and children. Photograph taken in the 1860s. Obviously, you can see they're pretty wealthy. Uh, William was a master cutler. He was a director of John Brown Steel Company, and he was influential in the establishment of Western Park Museum. But for a time in the 1860s, him and his wife lived in South America, in Brazil and Argentina. They were there on, or William was there on business. And there are a number of letters have survived, written by Martha, back to her mother in England and to her friends. And that gives us quite a good insight into um, slavery and servants in Brazil. The letters were written from Brazil. And Martha's quite confl conflicted. She has hired some servants, but in reality they're slaves. The local slave owners would have hired them out as servants. And Martha references the evils of slavery in some of her letters, and she dislikes intensely the um, practices of the slave owners, particularly when they whip their slaves. But clearly within her household, she might have seen them as servants, but in reality they were slaves. It appears she chose not to hire freed slaves as servants. She describes the freed slaves as fearfully depraved. So clearly she had a very strong view about um, those former slaves, and she was much happier hiring them from slave owners. She did form close bonds, it seems, with um, the people in her household, and some of the letters are quite touching. At one point, she writes back to her mother in England, and she wonders what her friends would think if they could see her, as she says, supported in the arms of a black woman. Um, the next example. If we move on to the manufacturing that Sheffield was heavily involved in, this is an advert from 1816. You could buy these plantation hoes from merchants in Sheffield, and you probably can't read the small writing there, but the names of these hoes tells you exactly where they were aimed at. Um, they were called the Barbados, the Demerara, the Virginia, Brazil, West India, and the Virginia hoes. 
and this is the slide. These are um, from trade directories, which are from the 1820s. These are a bit like the yellow pages of their day. They would list in detail all the tradespeople in the town. And there's just a couple of examples here. 1825, uh, William Butcher, who supplied West India and Brazil plantation tools. He was based at Air Lane. And then Sorby and Turner, they made machetes, cutlasses, and all kinds of plantation tools. And they were based at Wiley Street in the Wicker. And interestingly, for this example, Wiley Street, it was recent, recently renamed Windrush Way just last year. It's a bit ironic on that street that products were made that were shipped across to the plantations. Another useful source are the local newspapers. Most of these are available online. Um, and just one example from those, if you look in the 1830s, the discussions around the Corn Laws, which had imposed tariffs on trade, and there was a great debate about how damaging or not they were to British trade. Well, amongst those debates, as they were reported, again, you get a glimpse into some of the activities in Sheffield. So somebody claims that machetes used to be made to a great extent in the town, but were no longer done so due to market competition from Europe. And then somebody else wrote a letter to the editor of one of the local papers, and he posed the question, why did not we in Sheffield now send to the West Indies the machete, the sugarcane bill, the cutlass, etc.? when 15 years ago, we sent them all. The reason is, he says, they're now manufactured on the continent at less than half the price. So we can clearly see that, that uh, there was a market for these goods and a competitive market at that within England and Britain, as well as across Europe. And Sheffield was involved in the trade, despite perhaps the difficult market conditions. Uh, Vanessa's already mentioned the great work done by UCL on their legacies database. And if you type in the word Sheffield into the database, you'll get a reasonable number of references to individuals who were compensated and had connections with Sheffield. Um, it's certainly uh, a new area of research, I think, and much more is waiting to be discovered researching those individuals that have come up through the UCL database. Um, and really, I've only just very briefly run through Sheffield's connections with slavery. There's far more research to be undertaken, far more information to be drawn out. Um, and as I say, we, having celebrated the bicentenary of abolition, we've not majored on our direct involvement with slave trade. And just the few examples we've seen, clearly we were. And I'm sure there's yet more examples to be uh, discovered and uncovered. Another useful resource is the British Newspaper Archive, which is millions upon millions of pages of local newspapers, all available with free text searching. So whereas a few years ago, it would take you many months of painful research in reading newspapers, you can now search for any term you wish, and it'll bring back quite a few references to slavery or slave trade or activities in the West Indies or America, et cetera. So there is much more to be revealed, I'm sure. So much of what we know has come from archive collections held obviously both within Sheffield, but globally as well. Um, but I wonder really how representative the archive collections are. Um, they, they, the collections cover almost a thousand years of Sheffield's history. They emanate from, originate rather from a whole host of different organizations, local authorities, some central government departments, the faith and voluntary sector, businesses, landed estates, and individuals. And Chef has been collecting archive material for probably just over a century. We have very few of any powers to sort of enforce anybody to store papers or records with us. We work very much by negotiation and dialogue and encouragement to recognize the importance of record keeping and allow people to store material with us for current and future generations. And clearly we aim to be representative. And I wonder really whether we've got quite a long way to go to make sure those collections represent all the communities of the city. 
if we just look at our image library as an example, this is um, has over 100,000 images on it available on the web for anybody to search. It grew out of the local authority planning department, so it is biased towards streets and buildings. Whereas these days we're much more interested in human stories and lived experiences. But of those 100,000 images, I think less than 500 sort of relate to minority ethnic communities or people of colour. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage. Um, and clearly the, li the image library is biased towards the majority. And that is something that really needs to be addressed. You can see it just see here just a few examples from the database but it is really is a, a, a tiny percentage over the last few months we've also reviewed the collections in the wider sense the manuscripts and papers etc and that reveals that most of the collection predates world war ii we acquire material almost on a weekly basis, and most of what we acquire these days is probably post-World War II and into the 21st century. Um, but we have hardly, hardly any, if any, coming from a um, minority ethnic organisation or individuals in different communities. It's still very biased away from that area. In order to draw out references in the collections to all the different communities, we produce sort of easy read study guides. There's just an example there of six of them on the screen. There's over 80 altogether. And the aim of those is to encourage more research and draw out hidden references in the collections and make them much easier to find, to use, to read, etc. And the ones on the screen relate to South Asian communities, Yemeni, Black African, Black Caribbean, Somali, etc. And that they are there to really encourage more information and hopefully encourage more people to deposit material with us. We've yet to achieve that much fuller representation. We're very aware of that. And I think by having a dialogue um, around the importance of record keeping and archiving, hopefully would it, we would encourage more to come into the archive service. And as Vanessa said, it's like we are on a journey and we've got a lot of catching up to do and a lot more work to be done um, to make the collections really representative. Just moving on to statues of the public art, there's a few examples here on the screen. Sheffield does not really have any public statues that are overtly connected to slavery. And in fact, we don't have a huge number of statues to individuals. I think Sheffield's quite iconoclastic. It's got a healthy disregard for the great and the good. There is Queen Victoria, she's on, up on the screen, and her statue used to stand outside the town hall in the city centre. But in the 1930s, she was relegated to Encliffe Park, where she remains today. There's obviously a number of war memorials across the city, um, principally for World War One and World War Two. There are others for uh, other battles and skirmishes. There's the Monument in Western, and there was a Crimean War monument, so that one is in storage and not on public view. And um, if you look around the city, there's very few representations from uh, ethnic, ethnic and diverse figures. It presents an inadequate expression of our large and diverse population. If you think of the Shepherd Legends plaques outside the town hall, there is only one which relates to a person of colour. And that's Jessica Ennis. And having looked at street names over the last few months, uh, there's a few that are named, we think, after people heavily involved in slavery. There's Canning Street, um, Dundas Road, etc. Dundas Road's in Tinsley, and it's linked to the Dundas family of Edinburgh. And there's a large statue in Edinburgh to Henry Dundas. Though recently, the city council there has provided an explanatory plaque to explain Dundas's role in the slave trade and how many Africans were enslaved by him. We have street names linked to the empire. There's Empire Road, Jamaica Street, etc., and streets related to the abolitionist campaigners, such as Palmerston Road. 
and we have a new Windrush Way, and also streets named after international friendships such as Brockham Parkway or Esperanto Place or Donetsk Way, which is our twin town in the Ukraine. So that was a very brief look at those three topics and uh, more information about slavery on our website, but um, that's the research we've done so far. And I'll stop sharing if I can. Well, I think Nabila can stop. That's great. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Peter. It's really, really interesting. And I think an, in, uh, an interesting conversation to follow would be maybe where do we go next now that we've got this information and it's been it's collected? Um, how do we productively move forward? I know it's something um, the council have been discussing and, and it'd be interesting to get the views of some people here, I think, in the, in the later conversation. Um, before we get to that, um, Desiree will be speaking and I think performing um, next. Uh, and I'm really happy to have her here. I've been, um, many many interesting conversations with Desiree this year and the learning that she always gives me um, is boundless really so thank you for coming Desiree always good to see you in these spaces um, and I'm sure whatever you're gonna say or perform now is going to be brilliant so over to you <laughs> hi Alex hi everyone um, it's great to be here it's weird on these platforms isn't it but I'm sure we can I'm sure we can manage. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, and I'm going to read an extract from my short story called Born on Sunday Silent, uh, which I did on the back of having a look through the archives. And I'll get to that in um, in a minute. And I just thought I would talk about my my what my position is, if you like, or where I, where I what I think about it. And um, the I think the the important questions about thinking about decolonialities is also thinking about what do we mean. I think we've already said that Nabila said that very well at the beginning, and so is Alex, and so is Vanessa actually about what do we mean, posing those questions about where do we go from here. And I would like to pose another question actually, and who actually pays um, when we think about decolonizing? There's always a price, um, and I'm not sure whether institutions are ready to pay that price uh, and that price isn't necessarily about money either that that price is about I think as um, uh, Ella alluded uh, uh, to that price may be about mental health that price may be about at the risk of feeling alienated and not represented so I, I just wondered if we could put on the table um, the idea of, of who pays at, and at what cost including money also because uh, revolution always costs and um, and also i was um um thinking also about the role of capitalism the role of predatory capitalism uh something that we don't quite talk about when we're thinking about the connections between uh the african holocaust um and the legacies of the african holocaust and then thinking about what that means to us I mean, we understand about the money we understand in a way about how uh the compensation with the, that ran into millions means that um that we started off or england started off as a very rich country and therefore uh the money helped to perpetuate a certain lifestyle for many 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 people here but also the role of um, predatory uh, capitalism on what we think about or how we how we archive in a way and what we think about um history and i'm sure many historians here can can probably go into that a little bit more but i just wanted to put those two things on the table um just to remember uh, where we're at and also the other i think i wanted to put on the table i've got <laughs> this needs to be a big table i've got a lot of things to put on the table one of the other things i wanted to mention is that i'm uh being a writer uh, language is important to me so i do not refer to the people that have gone through the 400 years of trauma as slaves but as the enslaved i think it's important to mention that and to try and hold on to that they, they were people um not just statistics and not just uh n names written in in weird italic writing on yellowing bits of paper um so on to my short story so i'll tell you the history of that I was invited by Comma Press 
to talk about um to, to write a story about being based in Sheffield about living in Sheffield and being from Sheffield and I thought really can I can I effectively tell this story I'm not from Sheffield as you can probably tell but I really wanted to root it in something that was very connected to me so I, I, I felt like I needed to find a, a, a black and or brown presence in Sheffield pre pre-wars um, and I, I wish I'd had access to Peter before I did the story because that information was fantastic. Um, but I really, really wanted to find this. The, I felt like there was a connection, but I actually couldn't find it. And I, again, my going back to what I wanted to say about the table, I do feel like the other thing that we talk about, we do talk about uh, decolonial as in trying to de decentralize Western philosophy from curriculums. And I get that but also thinking about access of knowledge, um, who has access to the knowledge in the first place. If you're outside of the academy as I am, um, and I've been in the academy and then out again, then access to certain things isn't very, it isn't, it isn't apparent, it isn't out there, it isn't open, it's a, it's a, it's a big search. And even though uh, obviously we do have an archives here and we do have an excellent library here, um, libraries I should say, it still is a bit of a search if you're outside of the academy. So I want us to think about who gets access to this information and then how we disseminate it as well, because it, I don't think it's something that can stay in beautiful libraries like Western Bank when people uh, need to find out and wondering how we get that out to as many people as possible. Understandably, we're talking about websites and stuff, which is great, but there needs, as everybody said, there's more work that needs to be done. Um, so Common Press contacted me about this story and I, and I couldn't, and as a writer, I view, I view most writing, I'm a jobbing writer, um, so I view most writing challenges as something that is like a, a little bit like a, like a castle that I've got to keep knocking to see what my access to this information could be and how I can, how I can find the story and find the story within myself and find the story so that I can effectively write it so it touches people as it touches me. So then I um, thought about it and I am actually a Sheffield Hallam alumni. I used to live on Stool Cullies Road when I first got here and I um, live bang next to uh, Sheffield General Cemetery where I spent many a time uh, possibly not actually working in the way that I should have done to get the grades that I needed. So I I knew that the cemetery, well, I knew I wanted to play, I knew I wanted the cemetery to play a kind of an important role in what the story was going to be. And I understood that there was some kind of black and brown presence in the cemetery. So I went to the cemetery, I went to, and, and they were they were great, by the way, uh, cemetery, Sheffield General Cemetery are fantastic and they're really, really useful for, for uh, and helpful. They will give you everything that they've got about whoever is buried there. And there were 86,000 burials in Sheffield General Cemetery and it's beautiful as well it's very beautifully maintained so um I finally um found Kai Akusiamansa who was brought she was born in 1902 and was brought over here uh, well she was before she was born by uh, her mom in a in a within a shanty village a shanty village of over a hundred Ashanti villages was brought to Sheffield and apparently it toured the north. I didn't know that. Um, I think it went to Scarborough. I, after I wrote the story, I got um, quite a few um, emails saying, oh, it came here, it came there. So it actually went to Scarborough. And um, what I what I wanted to do was I wanted to write her. I wanted to find a way of writing her. So um, one of the methodologies that I think is quite useful, I think you guys might find useful, is critical uh, fabulation. This is Sarja Hartman, and it's a way of Sarja Hartman coined it, and it's a way of marrying archive with history and narrative. And it's supposed to be an effective way of filling in the gaps left by the 400 years of the, of the 400 years plus sometimes of the of the African Holocaust. It's meant to fill in the gaps that is left, the voices that are unheard. So when we talk about decoloniality, we must also talk about erasure, we must also talk about silences, 
and that's exactly what I wanted my short story to be about. So do look up Sarja Hartman. Um, uh, she wrote it. Um, she's Kate. She came up with the term thinking about an enslaved African woman, um, and I think the 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 essay is called Venus in Two Acts. So do do check that out. Um, it's a it's a brilliant piece of work, and it's a way of humanizing the archive as well and uh, we're not just talking about things that happened a long time ago we're also talking about things that happened a long time ago that have still affect us now and I, I, and kind of peopling the archive if you like so um that's what i that's what i really wanted to do so now after i've witted on i'm going to read um the short story not all of it because it's far too long um but um this is i'm gonna have a 50. Uh, so this is Born on Sunday Silent. I fell in love with myself from early on. I fell in love with my name. I cross roads, I jump water, I climb trees, I walk the paths, small fists, gripping myself, small, small fists. I am Kai Akusia. Like the last point of an echo, getting smaller and quieter as time goes, that the noise is forgotten, edited, it is done. My bed, open to wind. I try to find some others. In a city as old as Sheffield, there must be others, more like me, far from home, but here to stay, Kai Akusia, to lose yourself, in other than home. Home is in your eyes and mine, but I am eyeless. Third daughter, what of my sisters? What of one and two? As if I, a child, can understand the connection that made me. As if I, a child, born on Sunday, silent, is knowing of any other desire but for my mother, my home, my breath. Home is a lost sentence, a foreign land I have no visa for. The war that brought us under the English boot also took us here. A broken warrior should not be displayed, but such a price for food or freedom. Ditch diggers can dance, but I can't, born on Sunday. There is gold that hangs from your ears, necks and wrists. 400 years of looting and yet my fists are empty. But the silence contains a brutality. When I came here in my mother's belly and you had already been there lifetimes, as she squatted against the cold in so much cloth she could barely move, she and her sisters and my sisters crouching over pots and their weaving. They watch the ditch digger dance. I tell her I'm here. I tell her I'm coming. When I went to the Central Library, the people there looked me in the eye and told me I didn't exist. Empire and the slave trade rested differently. They had untethered from each other. They gave me a big folder. I pointed out that there were only notes on abolition, Wilberforce, Mary Ann Rawson. But where is the information about Sheffield and the trade? We don't like talking about that, it's too uncomfortable. I like that she hadn't pretended that it didn't matter. I like that she looked at me. The librarian shook her head with a disbelief and embarrassment. She said, we don't want to hear about what we did, only what we did about it. She looked out at the full shelves of books as if still looking for the answers. This is not accidental, I tell her. No, she says, it isn't. Poking around all things is what I like to do. I think I will be sat in a room with letters and boxes and dusty declarations of love or hate or greed. I'm not though. The woman shows me a computer. 
the answers are only as good as the questions that I ask it. Meetings to discuss abolition reported in newspapers, charters, and again, Marianne. How can books contain so much silence? How can this computer? And yet, I'm prepared now, as you listen or not listen to me, the silence is not accidental, but willful and spiteful. Will you honor it this time? Poor legal star dies in this city. In the papers I saw on the computer, he's described as being best behaved among the braves. He was best behaved and I, the third daughter of a ditch digger. He's softly spoken. He has the sad eyes of his horse, more the children he did not raise. When he walks, I cannot hear him. He says he's glad he's home and wishes the same for me. I am born on Sunday silent. I walk the paths. I roll down the steep banks. I jump water. I climb trees. Home is a memory that I don't have. And all I remember is here. Be that as it may, it is only left to say with my hand on chest where there is no heartbeat that you move along now. You have taken too much already. So I'm going to stop it there because I'm pretty sure listening to me reading stories is probably a little bit dry and boring. But um, the 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 search for Kai was quite interesting. And what I've tried to do is I've tried to put so the story is the story of the story, if that makes any sense. So when I went to the Sheffield Library, they did give me a folder and it did have the obligatory pictures of hoes in it and nothing really much after that. And then I went to the archive and also the stuff that I found looking, because I was trying to connect it to the cemetery, remember, that too wasn't what I was quite looking for and not as and not as um, detailed as I needed. So then I thought I needed to write that in the story. I needed to write the quest for the story in the story to therefore, um, to therefore, kind of locate myself really because I was new to this shit to the city also and I wanted to feel like this is I'm new she's new um and it's I, I also yeah it was something that I felt like she and I were connected in some way so she's buried at in Sheffield General Cemetery to um in a in an unmarked communal grave so um there's no kind of locating her properly but if you ever want to go and find her please uh when you do say hi <laughs> take a flower or something as a little honoring of of what that means and what that colonial past means and why she's ended up there thank you um I'm just going to clap on my own because we can't do it. We can't do it all together. But I'm, I'm sure everyone's doing the same thing in the in the living rooms. Thank you so much, Desiree. That was gorgeous. And I, I did just share a link. I did just share a link uh, for the press, Comma Press, who Desiree already shouted out. And this is the book, if you can see it. Uh, this, um, yeah. So do feel free to, to make a purchase. It's a good good one. Um, thank you. That was such a great way to, to end this portion of the event. Um, and, uh, you know, we do have uh, just over half an hour left. So as Alex already said at the start, if you could send either myself or Alex directly a question that you might have, um, that would be super. And then we can just kind of moderate because we have such a big audience and the blackboard's a bit, a bit weird for, um, <laughs> for managing this kind of thing. So yeah, do feel free to ask us questions. And in the meantime, I just wanted to give the panel themselves, because we're so diverse, a chance to ask each other if you had any burning questions for anyone. I know Vanessa, um, Vanessa's whole kind of contribution was based on a set of questions. So if anyone had any comments on that, um, yeah, from the panel side. I have a question. Um, a lot of the question is about archives and how people or things or representations become part of the archive. Uh, I, I set up an archive 25 years ago 
uh, mostly because my own community didn't have a record, didn't have a history, um, and I'm from a travelling background. So I, I, I set up an archive as a young postgraduate at the university, and now it has a national significance. I remember, um, I didn't actually realise the when that archive was set up that members of my own community came to that and said they were legitimised. They felt legitimised because they were in the archive. And I think the question I have is archives often, is often seen as aspects of power and control. So what is in the archive defines the history and what isn't in the archive. So I think the discussion that Pete had and I think what Desiree said is understanding to get that into the archive because that becomes the institution. And as Derrida says, it is the legitimization of a city as opposed to the history of a city. So that's my question. How do we get this into the actual universal archive for the city and for people, rather than relying on the web? It, it's certainly a, a challenging area. And I'm fascinated to hear Desiree's experience of the library and archive service and whether it's easy to use or difficult and challenging to get sort of into it if you like and once you've got into it what is it you find and i think the hundred years of archive collecting in the city probably like most other places reflects a certain history it isn't the whole history by any stretch at all um and it's probably probably only in the last few decades we've wanted to expand wider to make it all encompassing and collecting the official record is easy. Um, collecting other experiences is the challenging area and is one to debate and talk about and how, how is it done? Because I think as I briefly mentioned, the archives can't forcibly acquire material. It's very much around that sort of agreement and mutual understanding and long-term view of preservation and documenting the story um, and, and people understanding that their story is important and needs to be documented i'm not always sure people really know the value of their own story which we would love to archive does anyone else have any thoughts on that <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, Alex, I don't know if you wanted to field the questions next, or shall I just carry on? I do want to say, just in response to the chat, that uh, I have been copy pasting the messages, especially this really interesting contribution from Caroline Dixon, uh, who's who's at the geography department, I believe. So, so don't worry, those of you who've been asking for for the transcripts of the chat, we'll find a way of sending it to those who've been registered. Um, we have a question. To the, yeah, I do realise that the chat function isn't the most um, intuitive, but we do have a question from Nima uh, for anyone in the panel. Uh, where in the university do you think the focus on decolonisation should be? And if I might take the liberty, I, I, I hope we can ask, um, I wanted to ask Ella first, being a student. Um, where, what do you think the answer, what do you think your answer might be? Might be so was it where in the universe should decolonisation take place? Oh, I mean, I think everywhere. I think from literally my understanding of like history from first year, we had like a module where it was um, antiquity to modernity, and it was it, I was completely alienated by the whole module because it was so Eurocentric, and that's what really made me like feel like I really don't want to do. I did, it's like I didn't want to do this, but I was completely disenfranchised by the whole um, presentation of academia. And within every single period, there's de you can decolonize every single aspect, a small or large aspect of every single period. Um, I think I remember seeing like a tweet a couple of months ago where it said decolonize everything, and like I don't think anything is ever truer than that. So I think as a historian, you, there's always a narrative where you can research more and discover kind of that links towards oppressive powers, whether that be like patriarchal powers, colonial powers even kind of like systematic inequalities. So yeah, I think um, wherever you've got time, wherever you've got like knowledge of, try and go in and like research it more really. Yeah, 
What about anyone else in the panel? You don't have to necessarily work in this university to contribute. Uh, I know that the university is looking at this through uh, Pro Vice Chancellor level, that Professor Sue Hartley, who's the Pro Vice Chancellor of Research, is looking at this in the wider research questions. And I think a lot of the questions that we've uh, discussed today and the transcript and this whole presentation should be sent to them to understand that it's not just an aspect of um, the curriculum in history, but it's the whole university curriculum, but it's also how we approach well, how we work with partners and the city and the region. So I think it's a, it's a general discussion about how that is and institutionally how that one becomes. The university is a large bureaucratic institution like the city is a bureaucratic institution and often it isn't lack of intention. It's actually understanding in order to combat bureaucracy, you have to present it with a parallel bureaucracy. You have to kind of play them at their own you know, game of, um, you know, Gantt charts, data charts. You have to do that in a way. You challenge them by being as organised and de deconstructive in a way. Um, I, I've, I feel very strongly about this. I feel that I represent the university's role in the city and I am always very keen that it's a discussion and a two-way partnership and collaboration in the real sense of the word. I like to know that I practice what I preach and I'm also aware of the fact there are gaps in my team, my office and also in the university. So um, in terms of my role in the university, I will be taking what we've done today, what all of you have coll collaborated and contributed to, to the university senior management to see how they want to respond to it. So um, that that's what I can promise. Whether or not that response is what people want or the but at least we can start that debate. So that was one of the questions, how engaged are our CDN leaders? I think they will be engaged. I think we need to demonstrate how we do that. Yeah, and I just wanted to quickly jump in and connect that to what Desiree, I hope my mic is working. Can you hear me? No, yeah, can hear. yeah, great. Um, uh, what Desiree said earlier about and, and which she said it also in one of our own conversations about how the university itself is a resource for the community or the city, uh, whether it's um, whether it's a library or you know just getting access to to journals or anything like that. It's very much a contained resource. Um, and and how yeah, I just wanted if you wanted to speak a little bit more about that, Desiree, in terms of your own experience and access to from, from this university. Um. I think it was just the what I found tricky is is finding out very specific information um, and I guess that's what I mean about um, access and, and, I, and I take your point Vanessa about it not necessarily always being on a website but this is unfortunately this is where we are right now uh, and um, and the initiatives like the general cemetery where it unpacks um, who's buried there, where we talk about, um, where we signpost things that, that that haven't been signposted before. And I suppose the other thing that I that I think is really important is that the is the idea that um, that universities are separate from the cities that house them, and that they 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 aren't the ivory towers that they were. And I and I think that this one of the things that's a, that's interesting. I mean, I'm I, I'm a bit old, but I remember when um, when I was talking about uh, predatory uh, capitalism, but it, you know, like I remember when um, working class texts were were used. I, I studied uh, I, I boys from the black stuff and cares, and it's interesting that that probably wouldn't be the same now on on certain curriculums because uh, working class stories are also considered uh, not important enough as well as black and brown stories as, and and it goes on because we've kind of ghettoized in a way knowledge is being just about um, white crusty blokes and I think that's also about the years and years of a Tory government I don't think we should shy away from that in the way they've considered education um, and in the way that money plays a role in in, in, in knowledge and how we get it 
so I, I think that that there are things to be done and we obviously it's it's, in, it's important to stay positive but also I think it's important to recognize and acknowledge that yeah harms have been done and we and the universities because we have we have a couple um will be not just looking into this and also working together and making sure that that what they find is made public thanks Desiree. i think that really sets up nicely what i was going to ask next um and if people in the um, audience do have questions then please keep posting them to me and nabila um but i guess it's in reference to what you're talking about there desiree but also what um, pete presented earlier um a question that we posed really in the advertising of this event was what role should the university play in um, the process of decolonization in the city of Sheffield? Um, I think it's, that's a different question to um, the, the university's role um, and responsibility of decolonizing its own institution. But in terms of decolonizing the city of Sheffield, what do, and this is open to all the speakers really, what role do you think the university should um, be playing in that? And, I, and just to say one more thing to maybe help with answering the question is um, it's been recently the university has no business going near this because of its um, history of exploitation in the community and particularly of people and people of colour in the local community. Equally, uh, the university has access to many resources as be has been discussed, and therefore it seems. Um, has it within its power to support um, infrastructurally those who are doing the work in the city? Um, so there are arguments made both ways. So I'm just interested to know what are some of the what are what, how do you perceive the role of the university in the in the practice of decolonization in Sheffield? That's big, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Who's gonna go first? <laughs> I can okay I can I can I'm not quite sure uh I think we you know we all said at the beginning less at the beginning that we're you know, just going to keep posing questions we're going to keep posing questions and see what we come up with I think that it's something it's a it's a collaborative effort not just that the university does or universities does what it does and then comes back and presents its uh findings but that it's a collaborative stuff with people like you um alex doing what you do but for communities um universities tend to represent extraction uh it tends to represent an extraction of knowledge um and also resources uh including time i may add uh that perhaps the communities aren't necessarily um there isn't an exchange it's not perhaps um uh, an equal exchange so that's that's something that will have to be changed and to be the, the university is kind of and I'm not talking about Sheffield I'm talking about all universities um the, the the scary or the worrying thing is that they can represent not just the extraction like, extraction that I talked about but also the co-opting of language um the co-opting of language of resistance and resilience and it can come up with sometimes uh initiatives that are short-lived or underfunded um or hastily put together um where as as i can personally say the amount of times i get an email from someone saying do you mind doing this or do you mind doing that we've got to have it by next week that kind of thing is um not helpful or useful in a way that we work in a collaborative manner that's not collaborative that's just getting somebody to say something that you then take on to um, a department to then give you some money. So it's not it's not helpful to, you have to be there at the beginning, I think, uh, of any of these initiatives that community is also there at the beginning of thinking about these things. So I, I don't think that's necessarily just Sheffield, but everywhere as well. But in terms of Sheffield, uh, certain, uh, university structures, I know very little about those things. So I'll hand it over to Vanessa. Sorry, Vanessa, you're you're muted on mine. Are you muted on your computer? Oh yeah. Um, 
I'm not here to defend what we do well or what we don't do well. I, we do certain things very well with Sheffield in terms of economics, in terms of industry, in terms of advanced manufacturing. That's what the university is comfortable with. Uh, we're also aware of the fact that, you know, my own department, regional engagement and partnerships, we are looking at social inclusion. We're looking at societal benefits. And we realise that this, it's, a, it's a massive question. And I think I go back to what Desiree says. It's not just the university, it's the city. It's the council, it's the industries, it's the partnership boards. You know, there's almost a de facto aspect is what is the university doing? Well, what is other universities doing? What is Halland doing? What are, all, what are all of us doing? I try in my own way to learn. I never ask an artist to work for me or my team without paying. I always accept the role of the communities. I argued absolutely vehemently with the AHRC when I did a funded project that match fund was an insult to the community projects but the institution that we work actually still has those ideas that's what I'm actually saying we're part of a small pond in a bigger wave that even our funding councils do not accept that communities should be paid so the academic is less inclined to ask for money I really basically just there is on one of my projects really absolutely made it clear that we were not going to do this research until the funding councils accepted the contribution of the voluntary sector. So it, it, it's almost like you become trapped in that and then and you have to stick your neck out and then you go within the city and you look at that. So I think, you know, going back to a very old philosophy, coalition of willing, but also actually putting a structure together. And when I, when I meant the internet and the web, I was more about fake news and fake history. I see the damage done by people reading stuff, even in, in all different causes. And as a historian, I would be probably like Ella, you just go back and go, you know, look at the historical facts and then you can argue what are historical facts. But I think it's, it's part of us all to have those discussions. And I would say it's an inclusive discussion and it can't always just be the university because then we're just representing one set of power with another. And I'm very wary that we don't just step into the gap of what does the council do would have been the call 20 years ago when I was at the university student level. What does the council do for us? You know, so I, I think that that is good. And I, I'll take a lot of the things I've learned from here to, to have those discussions with the U university hierarchy and bureaucracy that I work within. And, um, uh, and I'll be judged by my actions. Thanks, Vanessa. Sorry, I'm just seeing that the questions are coming thick and fast now, now that we have <laughs> less than 15 minutes left. But um, I did just quickly, because Vanessa about the council, we do have a member of, you know, not a representative of the council, but we do have a member here, and I just wondered if Pete had anything to say um, to any of these comments. It's up to you, though, obviously. Uh, I'm not sure I can answer Alex's question about the role of the university, or even that much around the role of the council, being where I sort of sit within the council. Um, but I wonder whether whether an element of decolonization is around democratizing the story and the record. If the record is hidden and untold, subject to fake news and misrepresentation, maybe there's a onus on all of us to um, tell that story, expose it, um, put it out there. That is the story of the city, I suppose. Um, yeah, I'm not sure that, that answers the question really. But. Thank you for those responses. I think um, it was really important to raise that point about um, pay. Uh, as Elin says in the comments section, that is often the barrier to participation and inclusion. Um, and it was it's, it's a really important factor. Um, the financial structures and limitations are something that are always the first thing that needs to be navigated when trying to do um, any kind of decolonial work and it's a it's a frustration um, that is faced almost every single time when it comes to any kind of project so um, it was really helpful um, for Nessa for you to have raised that. Um, one of the questions that have come through in the comment box um, I think it speaks to something that uh, has been brought up a few times in conversations recently about uh, I think this dichotomy that is sometimes presented about um, the university um, and the city um, and of course it's, it's, it's important to point out that the university um, includes people that are from the city 
um, like Ella, for example. And so that dichotomy actually isn't a fair reflection of actually the people that, that comprise it. Um, even if there are probably less people from the city, certainly people of colour from the city in the university than we would like, um, those, those people, staff and students are here. Um, and so a dichotomy between the university and the city isn't particularly helpful. That can often be the perception. So again, I think that was an important thing, um, Vanessa, that you touched on there. Um, a, a kind of connected question comes from Catherine, um, which is, I'm interested in a community-led approach to decolonizing place-based histories. Have any of the panel's specific tips for how we can practically enable, quote unquote, ordinary people to lead this work? So I guess uh, the question is, how do we empower, um, as I say, quote unquote, ordinary people to lead the work of um, decolonization? Sorry, I just want to st step in. I just saw that Roland Atkinson also um, kind of added to Catherine's question by saying that um, ownership of this kind of, of what we're talking about here resides in the wider community too. So how can the university, and I would add, should the university assist in these dialogues? So, so maybe, uh, maybe Pete again, sorry, I'm bringing you in. Okay. <laughs> was very much uh, outside of the university. Um, yeah, would you like to have a go? Yeah, I think there was a point raised by Desiree around access and how accessible is history. And maybe it's it's quite a challenge to get easy access to archives and library collections. Um, and I know within my profession, it's, it's getting information out there about the place-based history or the whole of the city's history um, is one of our core activities. And, and one of the reasons we do those study guides is to draw out references to make it accessible because archival research can take a lot of time and um, isn't always easy. I think there's an onus on archivists and librarians and others to you know, we, we suck all in the, all this data into the collections and they're all stored centrally in the city centre. But how, do you, how does everybody else understand them, get access to them, use them, tells their community story, etc. Um, it's a big question to ask and I'm, I'm not sure how easy it is to answer it. Um, to, judging from where the archive sits physically in the city and how it's accessed by members of the public. That's maybe one for debate, further debate. Um, I do think that the university should get involved with these types of discussions. I think first and foremost, like the university is educational, is like an educational production, and it's really important in how it has it is an educational kind of like site. And I think this links kind of what to Alex's question and then the question that um like Helen mentioned, Helen Turton mentioned about going into schools to decolonise primary and secondary schools. I really think that I feel really blessed that I go in, I've go i got the ability to go and pay, even though it's a student loan, £9,000 to study something that I actually really like and I have access to that. But I don't think that means that I shouldn't share it with the community and share it with other people. I think that's what the university should be doing rather than being a business model. I think it needs to go back to this educational sort of aspect where if I know something about Sheffield, why should I, why shouldn't I share it with everyone in Sheffield and people who want to be involved in it? Um, so I do agree like a community led approach is such a powerful thing that I think if you try and like get in touch with the university, I think they really should kind of like engage in that relationship. I think the problem, what we're kind of like addressing is just the power imbalance that can happen, which is unfortunate when you actually approach these relationships. I think Alex and I have been like involved with our work with Sadak and we've kind of tried to like navigate through this kind of like power imbalance which is just almost inherent but I think when you look at the educational facility of the university it should be that should be its interest rather than making money or rather than attaching slogans to certain things. Uh, Ella that's amazing thank you so much I wish well I'm hoping that this this recording does reach reach um, the ears of those, those who are kind of in charge of this at the university. Um, I'm recognizing of the time, uh, we don't have much time left, but don't worry, I am going to kind of figure out a way of distributing these comments because, I mean, there's a really rich 
uh, conversation going on here in the chat box too. I did want to ask this question, uh, kind of link some of these questions that have come from uh, Faith Held. Faith Held, forgive me if I mispronounced that. And I also saw a question about culture wars and, and kind of the media um, sensationalization of some of these events. So I wanted to ask, link these two questions and ask, you know, the, the problem is that these universities, this particular university, and the people deciding and leading and interacting in questions of decolonization are overly white, uh, over, overwhelmingly white. So, you know, how do we take action? How do you address this? We also had a question from Udit Takre about the English being the kind of lingual fracture. And obviously that's a direct uh, consequence of colonialism. But, you know, how do we operate? How do we diversify beyond the language of English and beyond the whiteness of these institutions? It is a big question, so no worries. It's, <laughs> you can't answer all of it, but just, Maybe, I don't know, Desiree hasn't spoken for a bit. Oh, wow, that's so big. Um, thanks, Nabila. Um, I think it's something that, unfortunately, we just can't answer it here. Um, and I would like to be able to, to give those answers, and I'm sure everybody else would, Pete and Vanessa and Ella would, but we're just, we're at the beginning of these massive conversations. We cannot have this chat, right, without mentioning all the stuff that's happened this week. Um, Nabila and I were talking about how exhausted we were with the whole Meghan Markle stuff. And I think perhaps one of the things, one of the ways that we can make things accessible is by saying this is happening. What has struck me again and again and again is how much we want to say how much uh, a, a whiteness or white oppressive structures or and also the media want to say it's not happening or it's not necessary going back to what i think also mentioned about the war on woke culture and i think that that's um that's that's it's so incredibly dangerous and i, I and for communities to join in To be, feel, to, to feel seen by any kind of massive structure, be it the council or the university, then they, there has to be some kind of acknowledgement that these things are happening, that racism does happen, that um, <clears throat> sexism does happen, that, that the oppressions against working class, that does happen. And two, I think we're stuck, we're still, we're continuously stuck on, on not really accepting that it happens and we have massive, massive arguments about whether it happens or not. And then we haven't moved on and to to what we're going to do uh, to fix it or to work on it or to find these these collaborative initiatives. So I think we're I think we're really stuck. And I think that any any massive structure. I mean, we saw all the little black squares that happened in June. Um, and perhaps it's about us holding those businesses and those people that put up the black squares a, a little bit more accountable. But in terms of what we what 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 can a massive structure do well a massive structure can say yes there's a problem we've got uh, just a few minutes um i know alex is going to close but i just wanted to quickly use this platform based on what desiree said and um and some of these really great comments um not the last one but the one from carol and dixon i don't i know I mean, it's something that people don't want to talk about, but hire people of color, both in the council and the university, hire people of color in a, on a permanent basis. I'm not on a permanent contract. I don't think Carol is. Please forgive me if I'm wrong. Um, so many of my people of color, people, colleagues of color are not on permanent contracts. I mean, there's a reason for that. So let's, let's start with really concrete ways of addressing this issue, um, whiteness, coloniality. <laughs> let's start paying people. Let's start hiring people permanently, and then maybe we can start to change the narrative um didn't mean to hold the last word sorry uh but we have run out of time really sorry we've had loads of fantastic questions this event will be recorded so don't worry hopefully we can continue the conversation in future events and hope the panelists will be generous enough to share their time i'll hand it to, to alex now yeah no i just want to reiterate what you've said then nabila thank you so much to all the speakers it's been a really interesting discussion um, and thank you to everyone as well for joining in the chat. There's been some really um, interesting provocations, but also links to um, other arenas where these conversations are happening, both in Sheffield and 
uh, outside of it as well. So hopefully people have had a chance to click on those links and we'll continue the conversation afterwards. Um, see all the uh, goodbye messages popping up now. So I think it's a good time to say goodbye. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Have a good weekend. Um, I look forward to speaking to you all about this some other time in the future. Uh, so thank you. Thank you.